into the city of Jerusalem. And every time I hear Asher speak, There's such life in what he brings. And we've been looking forward to having him with us, and now here he is. So, <laughs> so welcome. I just wanted to say hello to everybody here. It's been a long time since we've been with you. And it's always a pleasure, a blessing, and a lot of fun. And uh, so thank you for inviting us, and God bless you from Jerusalem. Amen. And I also want to invite up here with me Ben Jester, my dear friend, partner, son in the faith. Hey, by, by the way, did you notice, did you remember that this is the Feast of Trumpets this morning? I mean, I uh, how many of you brought your uh, shofars with you today? Lift them up. Listen, we're going to have a time of blowing shofars right at the end of the message, not before. <laughs> so, so get ready, get your uh, guns loaded, but we're going to have a great time. But uh, we'll put that up there for a little graphics. Ben, share something with us. Good to be with you all today. I was reminded in the sweet presence of the Lord in worship how there's a season when kids love to be gathered and cuddled and loved, but then as those children grow older, many of you have experienced how those kids start to pull away a little bit and they demonstrate a little independence. Uh, I hope that you don't have, but I know that many of us do, those teenagers and young adults who actually pull away, not just in independence, but rebellion. And the kingdom of God is designed in such a way that we cannot really understand it unless we understand his creation of man and woman. It's beautiful. From the very beginning, he designed that relationship to demonstrate something of who he is, and something about his kingdom. And I was reading in Matthew 23, of course we know the end of the chapter when it says in verse 37 that Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem. And he said, how I longed Jerusalem to gather your children as a mother hen would gather their chicks, but you were not willing. And I think of this from two angles. Number one, we see the pining and intercessory heart of a mother whose children have walked away from the Lord and have become rebellious. And how their heart is not anger and judgment, but it's, oh, how I long to gather you back in my arms so that we might have relationship again. And then I think again of the open arms that are waiting of our Heavenly Father and how important it is that we get to a place of willingness to humble ourselves and say, I'm willing to be gathered. I'm willing to be embraced again. I'm willing to put away the emotional baggage and really ready to move forward with the Lord. Now what's the point of this? We are in a season where we cannot hit snooze on the alarm call anymore. And I know what Asher is going to share. I'm not going to steal that thunder, but I just want you to be aware we're 500 years now past the Reformation. 75 years we celebrated just earlier this year since Israel became a modern state. The unity of the church, and I'm not talking about an ecumenical kind of kumbaya, I'm talking about a unity that is grounded in the word and based on prayer is starting to spread around the world. We cannot sit back and miss the moment that God has called this generation to. And whether or not we are the generation that sees Jesus step on the Mount of Olives or not, we may be the generation that prepares and releases that generation. And so I again come back to that idea of a mother, that intercessory pining 
to restore the children back to the Father. And let's do that together as we pray contemplatively about what the Lord would have as we answer the sound of that trumpet. I've been walking now for most of my life, really, with this man who's standing next to me, Asher Intrader, along with my father, who um, were part of founding a, they didn't design to found a movement, they wanted to found a covenant bond of relationship and love together and see what the Lord would do out of all of that. And the result of that has been 40 years plus of loyalty and integrity and kingdom fruitfulness. Not always easy. Because for those of you who know, churches split, ministries divide, scandals happen. But not only that, personal relationships make things difficult. But what they've demonstrated through their life is the commitment to seek the Lord together creates the long-term fruitfulness and trust and love that demonstrates who God is. And so we have a brief video that will introduce not only Tikkun Global that we all share in together, but we'll also set Asher up to share with you. So if we could uh, play the video there on the screens. Hi, friends. As you can see, we're here in the old city of Jerusalem, right in front of the Tower of David. You can see the walls of the old city right here. We thought this was a good place for me to just tell you what our vision is at Tikkun Global Jerusalem. The vision and the heart of all the ancient Israelite prophets and of all of the Messianic apostles in the New Covenant are all pointing to the same thing. And we believe historically this is coming together right now. And that's what we're serving for Tikkun Global Jerusalem, serving this vision, both of the apostles and the prophets, from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth and back again. So really everything we do comes out of who we are here in Jerusalem for Israel and for, for the nations. And so that means that in Israel, we are working to build up congregations on the ground to train and raise up and disciple Israeli believers, leaders, pastors, evangelists. Out of our center here, uh, we do a lot of different things uh, from uh, outreach to teaching, meetings, worship. One of the things that is truly on our heart here is the heart of worship. Yeah, that's something that we both have had the privilege and the honor to lead together and do it together as a couple. And especially on Thursdays um, is our time at the base where we receive people from the nations. And it's so beautiful to be able to worship the Lord in Hebrew, in English, and also sometimes in different languages. And so it's really our expression of receiving the nations and coming together and worshiping the King. So really everything we do comes out of who we are here in Jerusalem for Israel and for, for the nations. And in the nations, we are building relationships based on covenant partnership with like-minded believers from every nation who want to join in this kingdom vision of preparing for Yeshua's return. And we're looking to just continue the plan of the Great Commission to share God's kingdom from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth and back again. And the Bible tells us that we need to preach this gospel of the kingdom into every nation and then the end will come. So we are serving God's kingdom here, but we believe the message of the kingdom of God will change people's hearts through the love of God and the sacrifice of Yeshua on the cross, that we will be changed and we're all moving toward the culmination of all things. But in the end, we're gonna see the Garden of Eden restored in heaven and earth together, and we want you to join together with us. Amen. I want to say thank you, Ben, for that introduction, and it's so sweet. I try all the time when I, when I teach to bring a younger son or daughter in the faith with me. Ben is with me here this morning, and Anna Damien will be with us here this evening. And uh, it's very special with Ben because uh, Dan was really the person that discipled me 45 years ago. So we're having the change in, in generations, and we do that on purpose as part of our covenant 
both to be loyal to one another, but also to bring up the next generation. Amen. Okay, well, we want to talk today about the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, excuse me, and uh, see if we can get our uh, screen. There we go, Feast of Trumpets. So today, right now, is the Feast of Trumpets, and I'm hoping to share a, today a, a two-part series on the book of Revelation. The, in this morning, we'll talk about the Feast of Trumpets leading up to blowing the seventh trumpet in the kingdoms of this world, becoming the kingdoms of our Lord. And tonight, hopefully, we'll talk about uh, that the bride has made herself ready for the coming of the Lord. Those are our uh, two goals today. And uh, I just want to start also and say that I really love you all and appreciate you. Uh, we've been walking together for many years, I think over 20 with you, and we just love you. And I want to say more than ever, we need you. We need who you are, and we want to be one with you. We love you, and I hope you can feel the, the embrace that I give you, the hug from here. I, I realize as I'm getting older that, that uh, the things that last forever is your love. The other things can start slipping away and fading away, but I want to tell you that we love you, and we feel one family with you. All right, amen. All right, well, get your antennas out, get ready to go. We got a lot of word. Uh, we're talking today about the Feast of Trumpets, and uh, the goal that I feel from the Lord today is to prepare you, equip you, release you, energize you to become victorious warriors for the end time spiritual battles that we see in the book of Revelation. I believe that's going to happen today. I want you to feel that. I'm not looking to teach about something. I believe this is something that God wants to make happen in your life and in my life right now. This is a new period and we have to walk forward. We were praying before the service with some of the leaders and we're thinking, you know, a lot of times you, it's like you're sitting in a train station talking about something theoretically. And then the time comes when the train's about to move out and you either got to get on or get off. Well, the train is moving out into the end times, and I want all of you and all of us to get on the train, and we're going to move out together with the Lord. Amen. Well, I have seven verses to share with you. It's going to be a lot of information, but I want to get you equipped. I feel you have the right heart, but I want to put some bullets in your guns. You know, I want to, I want to give you some, some equipping information from our perspective as Jewish believers in Jerusalem. This is the Feast of the Blowing of Trumpets. That's found in Leviticus 23. Let's read it together. In Hebrew it says, B'chodesh ha-shvi'i b'chad l'chodesh yeh lachem shabaton zichron l'truwa l'mikra kodesh. In the seventh month and the first day of the month, you will have a Sabbath day, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. First thing for you to notice there is the pattern of seven. Did you get it? This is the first day of the seventh month. I mean, it's the new moon. The first day of the month in the Hebrew calendar is always when you don't see the moon. It's a new moon. The 15th day of the month is when you have a full moon, and that's always when you have the harvest. The big feasts are when you celebrate is on the 15th day because God planned it that you could have a nice meal with your family outside. But on this day is a new moon when you blow the trumpet when you don't see the moon at all. It's a seven, a pattern of seven. Like the creation was in seven days. The priestly calendar is a seven-month calendar. This is the seventh month. People call this the New Year's. It's not the New Year's. This is the seventh month. And that, that pattern of seven goes on. Seven months, seven years, 7,000 years in the, human, in, in the history of the human race. So this is associating this, this seven uh, loop of seven cycle pattern in the blowing of the trumpet. You'll notice here that it doesn't tell you much meaning to this. It gives a clear priestly symbol. You have to blow the shofar, but it doesn't tell you what the prophetic meaning is. So I want to tell you the prophetic meaning of the, ple of the blowing of the trumpets, how could it not be, is the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation. I'll think about that for our people that are blowing the trumpets like this every year and they don't really understand what's the ultimate meaning of it. On the other hand, if you read the book of Revelation and you see the seven trumpets, but you don't, and you just think like 
Jesus made that up or something. John made that up at the end. And you don't see that it's connected all the way to the plan of God from the beginning. You're going to miss the meaning of it. You're not going to have any authority to it. And I need you to go out from here with authority in the word of God to do what you're called to do. So the first thing is to see where it's rooted here. The meaning of the Feast of Trumpets is in the blowing of the trumpets in the book of Revelation. I hope that's clear. That should be fairly obvious. But the trumpets of the book of Revelation are during the period of time which we call the tribulation. So in other words, the Feast of Trumpets is referring to the end times period called the tribulation. The time of the blowing of the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation is the tribulation. Amazingly enough, in the Torah, the law of Moses, Moses already saw this I mean, I don't think he understood it. We understand it now looking back upon it. But God set in motion in the priesthood of ancient Israel a symbol which would prophesy ultimately about the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation and the period of tribulation in the book of Revelation right in front of us. Now that might be nice, might be a nice discussion. What does the trumpet mean? What's the feast mean? No, 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 we don't have any time for that anymore. It's here, it's now, it's being fulfilled in front of us. We gotta get ready. The theoretical part is not here anymore. The time is to get ready and do that. So I wanna equip you with the shofar. I don't mean that you all have to go out and buy a shofar and blow it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you knowing what the meaning of this is so that when you prophesy in the end times, you're going to do it with full meaning from Genesis to Revelation and you're going to have more authority and more clarity and more focus on what you're saying. Now, there are different types of holidays in the Bible. I'm hoping most of you know this. I'm giving this kind of quickly as a review, just a background. There are different types of holidays in the Bible. There are seven holidays which are called appointed times, which they have the most kind of eternal uh, meaning to them. And there are three in the spring, which of course is uh, Passover, the first fruits of the Omer, and then you have the, the uh, Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. Amazingly enough, in those three holidays, on those same dates, took place the three main events of the New Covenant. The crucifixion of Jesus on the Passover, the resurrection of Jesus on the first fruits of the Omer, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Shavuot. Now we would think at that pattern that it's likely to be, obviously be scripturally mandated that the holidays in the fall are going to have the fulfillment of the second coming of Jesus or the end times. They don't have that yet. In the fall there are four holidays. It's a whole different teaching. I'm just giving you a taste of it here. But the four, the four fall holidays are trumpets, atonement, tabernacles, and the eighth day assembly. Now, what we're talking about today is trumpets. The meaning of trumpets is fulfilled in the tribulation. The meaning of atonement is fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus. The tabernacles fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. And the eighth day celebration is fulfilled in the new heavens and new earth. Now we are talking today about the seven trumpets of the tribulation. Now it's interesting that also means seven years. Well, if you blow the trumpet once a year and you have seven trumpets, that's seven years. We'll get to that in a moment. All right, that's the background of what we're talking about this feast today of the Feast of Trumpets. Let's go on. Next verse. Now we're going to begin to approach what is the meaning of it for you? The next word I want to give you right now is it has to do with, with victory. Hallelujah. We have a great example of that in the book of Joshua, chapter 6, in the story of Jericho. Let's see that. I'm just reading verse 16. I want to remind you that what happened, they, they circled the city how many days? Seven days. You see the pattern? The first six days, they went around the city and they blew the show, but they didn't say anything. And the seventh time, they circled the city seven times and then shouted victory. We're going to do that in just a few minutes. Hallelujah. But don't do it till I tell you. <laughs> Here's the verse. Verse 16 says, Vayiba pama shvi'it, takhu akonim bashofarot, vayomer Yehoshua el ha'am hariu. And it was on the seventh time that the priests blew the trumpet 
And Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So you get ready. At the end of this, we're going to blow the shell first, and we're going to shout uh, a shout of victory. Amen. Now, it's interesting when you look at the story of Jericho that God did the whole battle before they even got there. It's amazing, and there's a play on words here, it, because it says, Moses said, Joshua will go before you to fight the battle. And then it says, Joshua will lead you. But Joshua is the same name as Jesus. It's really a play on words saying, Jesus will go before you, and he will win you the battle before you, for you, before you even get there, when Joshua, the man, is leading the army. That's what I call the big J and the little J. But anyway... <laughs> So they never even got a chance to touch us. Now, this was a real battle. It was a battle that changed history. It was a battle of conquest, military battle. Everyone in the city of Jericho was killed, except, of course, for Rahab and her family. So there was a real military outcome. But what brought the military victory? There was no military aspect to the victory at all. It was all just prayer. It was faith. It was prophecy. It was understanding the meaning of the shofar. Are you trying to hear what I, what I want to tell you? Is that by understanding the meaning of these priestly symbols and these prophetic uh, fulfillments, you can change history. You can make a real difference in military operations, in government, in changing history. But you've got to know what the meaning is. Here they never touched anything. They positioned themselves right. They prophesied it out. They prayed. They shouted. They blew the shofar. Ah, come on. It was in a glow meeting. They were blowing shofars and they had, and the walls fell down. Not like spiritual walls. I'm saying the walls of the city fell down. They conquered the city. That was the beginning of the conquest of Canaan. It was the beginning of the conquest of the whole promised land. By, by understanding what this shofar was. You hear what I'm trying to say to you? And also what they did when they understood it and they did it correctly, they shouted in victory. Now, a lot of us have gone through some difficult times in these last few years. A lot of us, and we believe 100% the power of the Holy Spirit, the authority of the name of Jesus, the victory is already ours. And yet, wow, some of us have gotten kicked around a little bit the last few years. And you think, well, you know, I believe all that victory stuff. But, you know, maybe, I don't know if I'm pre-post or whatever. I, you know, where, I, maybe I missed it somewhere. And I want to tell you, no. Part of the reason I believe the Lord put this message on my heart is because now God wants to restore to us. Renew this sense of victory. Renew this sense of conquest. Renew this sense of running forward. Renew this sense of shouting. Renew this sense of prophesying. Renew this sense of blowing the shofar. And the victory will be ours. Now, what happened in, when they conquered Jericho, was the beginning of the conquering of Canaan, the promised land. Now, there's a little tiny land. How many of you have been to Israel? You know, you can drive all across the country, one side, left to east to west, about an hour and a half, north to south, and about five hours. It's a tiny little country. But they conquered it. And, but there's another meaning to this. The other meaning to this is the land there has a double meaning. I told people that don't know Hebrew, this is the most important word you'll ever need to know in Hebrew other than the word Yeshua. And that is the word Aretz. The word Aretz is the promised land. It's the land of Israel. But the land, the word for Aretz, the land of Israel is the same word for planet Earth. So when you read the promises of conquering the land of Canaan, it's also actually saying conquering planet Earth. In other words, you have a specific prophecy with Joshua, which then becomes a universal prophecy to all of the believers as they conquered the promised land, this tiny little piece of property. You have, by spiritual inheritance, the authority to take possession of all of planet Earth there. This is the model. This is the prototype for the saints of God to take possession of planet earth and think about this now we're talking about you taking the principles of Jericho and applying it to every nation where you live in because your nation becomes the promised land to you because God promised it to you and if it's on planet earth it's in that covenant glory to God amen there's different types of sounds of the shofar. 
Um, and one of them, a sound called tekiah, is when you gather the people into an assembly. But this particular one on this feast of, of trumpets is tru'ah. The tru'ah sound is, means when you're warning the people of a coming attack and you're mobilizing them into action, into battle. So think about this. The meaning of this holiday is w during the time of the end times tribulations and the end times thing, God is blowing his shofar to warn us about the impending judgment, but he's calling you and me into action. He's mobilizing us into action. That's what you need to hear today, that God is going to mobilize, energize, put electricity in your spirit, calling you into action. That's what the sound of this shofar is, is to put you into action again, to go out and take an active part in the, in the end times prophecies. Amen. Let's go on. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Here we have another quote about the shofar. It's kind of interesting to think about this on the day of trumpets. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. It says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a shofar. Now, what did he hear? Did he hear a shofar? No. What did he hear? He heard a voice. And the voice sounded like a shofar. There is a symbol and there is a meaning. This is a symbol. The sound of the shofar is a symbol. It's not the fulfillment of it. What is the fulfillment of it? It's the voice of God speaking to us from heaven. And Jesus' voice sounds like the sound of a, both of mighty waters and of a trumpet. I don't understand exactly how that is, but it's a trumpet and many waters. It's a big voice. And when we blow the trumpet, it's to open us up to hearing the voice of the Lord. That's what we need to hear. We blow the trumpet to say, God, I'm listening. I'm believing you're speaking. I know that you're warning the world of impending judgment, and I know that you're mobilizing us into action. That I got from the pattern. And we're blowing the trumpet to say, God, we're, mo we're ready to go. We're, ready. we're like the tribes of Israel spiritually when they heard this sound. Doo -doo 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 -doo. They heard that sound and they said, well, there's an attack coming. Let's go into action. We hear an attack coming. Let's go into action. So what I want this message to do today is to put something in your heart. It's going to mobilize you into action. Something's got to come alive. Something's got to be activated to go into action for the end times. This is, this is true prophecy. This is a symbol of the sound of it, but prophecy is us hearing God's voice, His instructing us what to do. Some people argue about the different meanings of the book of Revelation, but what I wanna know is, what is He instructing us to do in that book? What's He telling us to do? Because I want to obey His instructions. I'm not interested in arguing about eschatology. I want to hear his voice. I want to know what he's telling us to do. And I want us to move forward and do what he's calling us to do. In general, of course, all of the, in the book of Revelation, in the difficult times, he's, the difficult times are a way of God demonstrating a message to people. And he's saying to, to the sinners, to the unbelievers, you need to repent. I said, this, is, this judgment is temporary punishment. But the end times are coming and you're looking toward the end. You need to repent quickly. And to us, as the saints who are going through this, this difficulty, our faith is being purified. It's being purified like gold. And we need to go through this. And so it's these, th there's a message in the difficulties of the end times, which is calling the world to come back to God to repent and calling us to walk in purity and in faith. So if all we see is the end times, you know, uh, my wife and I really, we love, to, we like to, we have a little hobby of like watching the eight o'clock news in Israel. We like to see, we turn on the television, it's in Hebrew, we enjoy listening to it. Well, actually we think we enjoy listening to it because we get about 10 minutes into it and we say, I can't stand it anymore, turn it off. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, it's all bad news. They don't have any good news. We have the good news. So we want to be able to hear the Lord's voice. This is the beginning of the book of Revelation. 
The point of the book of Revelation is learning how to hear God's voice as we walk through the events of the end times so that we can obey him and bear fruit during the end times. Was that too long a sentence to write down? Let me, let me say that again. The, the purpose of, uh, of the book of Revelation is that we can hear, this is chapter one, we can hear the Lord's voice speaking to us in the end times so he can instruct us, we can know what to do so that we can obey him and bear fruit during the end times. That's what the book is for there and that's what the Holy Spirit's voice is. He's, as I understand it, what he's saying is the book is like a map and the voice is like a GPS. Do you have ways here? Do you know what ways is? Well, anyway, but you have, so you've got the book of Revelation here as a map of the end times, but a map's not good enough. A map is not good enough for what's going on in traffic today. You don't want to go out in traffic today unless you get that GPS turned on. Because even though the map is correct, you don't know where the traffic jams are. So we have the map, which is the book of Revelation, but we got to have the GPS hearing God's voice instructing us where to go so we can get through the map. So what I'm saying is the map is not good enough and the GPS is not good enough. You got to be able to have both together. You have to understand what the map is saying and you got to be able to hear the GPS. You know what that's talking about. Let's go on. Now, Revelation, let's go all the way up now. We're talking about the fulfillment of this holiday is the seven trumpets, the tribulation period of the book of Revelation. And that's found in Revelation 8.2. In fact, all of the next verses from chapters uh, 8, 9, and 10, and 11 are all this period of the trumpets blowing. That It's a seven-year period. And it's a period that we are known popularly as the tribulation. Revelation 8, 2 says, And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So I see those seven trumpets from seven angels representing prophecy of the end times in a seven-year period, one year for each Feast of Trumpets. This is the day when the, st the next stage of God's plan for the end times, it, the trumpet is blown on this day because God is speaking to us about this next stage we're going into. That's why we need to hear it. That's not about Jewish culture or, 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 or tradition. It's about understanding what is the purpose of the blowing of the trumpet. What is, it, what is the time clock? What's it representing? And I'm saying on this day, of course we can hear from God on any day, 24 hours a day. But this particular day of the year is a day that's meant uh, to understand the meaning of these seven trumpets of God's instructions for us for mobilizing us into action in the end times. Seven chauffeurs for seven years of end time tribulation. So we look out in front of us, doesn't need prophecy or discernment to say this, there's a huge amount of evil and suffering in the world today. It's heartbreaking. There's so much evil. There's so much suffering. If you're a sensitive person, you don't even know how to deal with it. I went out to do my, I always do, at six o'clock in the morning, I do a prayer walk every morning. Went out, some of you may have done that on a beautiful river walk out there. Yesterday, there was 19 homeless people sleeping on the, on the Jacksonville boardwalk, river walk. Today, there were 21. And I looked at them, it was funny. I don't know what this has to do with it. I feel that there. What's interesting with them, it was an even number, what I looked at, of black, white, and Hispanic. Like it wasn't even a particular uh, racial group. I didn't see among them any broken glasses, no whiskey glasses. I didn't smell neither drugs nor, nor alcohol. One of them, I even saw, I had a little Bible open next to them. I said, God, people are suffering. People are suffering in the world today. There's suffering and there's also evil. Those are two different things. There's evil in the world today, but we have to not be afraid. We have to be strong. Because there is evil in the world, it comes from the world, the flesh and the devil, then there has to be conflict and war because God is a good and all-powerful God. If there's evil in the world, God wants to confront it. 
God can't just let evil and suffering be there. So if there is a huge amount of suffering and evil in the world, it means we're also going into, into a time of huge conflict between good and evil because God is good. Well, it's obvious people will say, if God is good and all-powerful, why doesn't he get rid of us? Because he's given people the ability to choose. It's sin and Satan and the world and the flesh that's causing that. And so God's, God wants to confront that. He, Jesus said in the end time, there's, there must be wars. There must be these conflicts. It has to take place. Because God is a good and loving and all-powerful God. And the human race has turned away in rebellion. And, and, the, and we've opened ourselves to, the, to demonic spirits. And God wants to confront that. So he's, there is going to be conflict. There is going to be war in these end, spiritual warfare in the end times. Because God wants to confront the forces of evil. And it's not for us to say, oh, I don't, want the, I don't want the evil and suffering. I don't want the conflict either. I'm sorry, folks. We were born for conflict. I mean, we were spiritually born for conflict. My flesh wants to go back and get in bed. But there's a lot of, particularly in this, this seven-year period of time, uh, if you notice, Cliff, there's, a, there's the number one-third keeps repeating itself. In the first trumpet, one third of the vegetation, and then one third of the of the of, of the sea waters, and then one third of the the, the uh, river waters, and then but then actually it gets to the point where there is going to be a war in which one third of the human race is going to be killed. That's during this seven year period, folks. I didn't make that up. One third of the human race. It's going to make every other war that we've ever had in history look like nothing. Now, whether you want to call that Gog and Magog or Armageddon or an ap apocalyptic war, but folks, we're moving into a time when every other conflict has looked like child's play. And we need to be strong. One third of the human race. Now, it's interesting. Also, as you go through those, these trumpet judgments, you keep coming back to a time period where it talks about it lasting like five months. It's interesting. So in other words, the period of time in each one of those trumpets is not a 10-year period. It's, it's about a year period. It fits in with that time. So it's talking about, Jesus described as birth pangs. It starts out slower and lighter and it's getting faster. and quick. So it's going through this time of being lighter and then getting stronger as, as going through the earth. Now, folks, that is what we are going to go through. And that's, we need to get ready for it. We need, because God wants us there. There's a third part to this. You see, the world is full of evil and suffering because sin and Satan. Our sin, Satan's rebellion. And it has conflict because God wants to, con to attack that. He wants to confront the forces of evil. Now, who, with whom is he going to confront the forces of evil? With us. That's the third part. We've got, you have a part to play in that. You've got the part to play of bringing the good into an evil world. You have the part to play of giving, bringing light into a dark world. I love how David prayed yesterday. I told him that yesterday. That what, that what you said is a verse that we all love in Israel uh, from, uh, from Isaiah 60, just speaking of, Kumi ori kiva orech, rise and shine because your, your light has come. Vine choshechichase arz, for darkness is covering the earth. Folks, darkness is going to cover the earth because of sin and Satan, but there is going to be a glory shining on us, and our job is to bring that light into the world. Now, uh, this is not really, for, I don't know if I'll talk about this tomorrow, but I just want to say there's, there's an approach to looking at the end times, which is we're not going to be here. We're going to be removed and watch it on closed circuit television in heaven. I want to tell you, that's a lie. Look me in the eyes, that's a lie. God's not calling you to leave this planet. He's called you to be a light for his kingdom in the midst of darkness. That's what you were made for. That's what you were born for. That's what you were trained for. God is about you sending you into the world to bring light and peace and truth and the gospel. And the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in every nation and then the end will come. This is not about us evacuating the planet. This is about us taking repossession of the planet. And there's another viewpoint that said it's already taken place in the past. All this has taken place in the past? Come on. So I'm saying, that now, I'm not having a theological argument. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about, I don't want a view in which you get your plug pulled out. 
I don't want to take out what, however you read the book and you say, well, that's not me. That's not concerned with me. It's got nothing to do. It'll be before me or after me or it's got nothing to do with me or, you know, that, that's not true. It's written in the book for you to understand it and get plugged in it so that you'll do the stuff written in the book. Not to make excuses why you don't do the things written in the book. Look at it this way. If we're about headed into the greatest conflict between good and evil that has ever happened in the history of mankind, if you were the devil, what kind of, what, what, what kind of lie would you try to get the saints to believe in other than to believe either they're not going to believe that either they'll not be there or, or they won't or it already happened or you don't have a partner in it or whatever to, to get you demobilized. And I don't want you demobilized, I want you mobilized. I don't want the plug pulled out of you, I want you plugged in. I don't want, want you de-energized, I want you energized. Because the greatest evil is in the world today and there's a huge conflict coming and the third part of it is that you have a part to play in it. We are representatives of Jesus Christ in this world. We are representatives of the Holy Spirit, of the light, of the truth, of the peace of God. And we go wherever it takes. You know, we have this, you know, we'll talk about this a little tonight when Anna is here. Well, one of the biggest problems in the world who was it? One of your team was telling us, praying about, was that you, Nancy? I was talking about that, praying about uh, that the biggest problem they saw in the world was, you know, Jews and Arabs hating one another in the Middle East. And started praying by faith, not really even believing that could happen. We just pray something will happen. Well, I want to tell you, there are Jew, Messianic Jews and Christian Arabs in the Middle East that love one another, and we have overcome all the forces of 4,000 years of hatred in the Middle East because of the love of Jesus. And that's what we're here to do. Uh, make excuses for not being involved. Amen. All right, next verse. Revelation 10. We're picking up on this word prophecy. Jane and for all of a girl, I want this is going to be a word. I want to make this a Remo, a Remo word for you all today, <laughs> for me too. Now, of course, it's talking about the Apostle John when he wrote the book of Revelation. You know, he has a, he has a vision. A, a big angel comes to him, he gives him a little book. He eats the book. He tells him to eat the book. He says it's sweet in his mouth and bitter in his tummy. Why is it sweet in his mouth? You know, it's the word of God. It's so beautiful. Even when God's telling you about, you know, disaster and judgment, it's so beautiful how he says it. I mean, he's just, he's the creator. Whatever he says comes out beautiful. So the book is beautiful. It's sweet. But when he starts to, when he starts to understand what it's saying, it's like, oh, no. And that's what happens when we read the whole Bible, particularly the book of Revelation. It's sweet. It's beautiful. But what it's saying is so bitter. And then he says to John, figuring John is about, you know, what is he, not, over 90 years old now. And he says to him, you must prophesy again about many people's nations, tongues, and kings. Let me read that to you again. You must prophesy again. You must prophesy again to many nations, people's tongues, and kings. Who was this talking about? Was it just John? Well, it certainly starts with John. Was that the, was that the end? Was the end of him? You know, it could be. It could be that was the end. His prophesying to many nations was writing the book of Revelation and we, can, and we can read the book to people. That's not how I understand how God works though. John had the privilege of writing this, of writing the book of Revelation and of course writing the gospel of John, but it's there for us today. It was sealed up in his generation. People didn't even understand it. It was sealed up so that what, what could happen with it? Somebody is at some point has got to come along and open this book and start prophesying it. Now I want to tell you, I think this is, now you can say it's not, but I believe this is a word from God for us today. You, you, me. We must, we must keep prophesying. In other words, maybe you thought, I mean, I've prophesied so many times, you, know, you think, well, you know, maybe I should retire, you know. But no, no, you have to prophesy again. It's not over yet. The battle's not over yet. You need to prophesy again. There's a whole nother stage. There's a whole nother wave of prophetic fulfillment. There's a whole nother wave of prophecy coming. You must prophesy again. You must prophesy again. That wasn't just for John. That's anybody who's reading it. I feel like John's in heaven right now. Going, Come on. Take my book. Eat it. Swallow it. Let it be sweet. Let it be bitter. And then speak it out. 
And we need to pray it. We need to prophesy it. We need to teach it. We need to bring the truth to this into the world. You must prophesy again. It's not over, folks. The prophetic movement has not come to an end. But it is coming into a different stage. And we need to, because you can't stay back where you were before. When God opens a door, you got to walk through it. God's calling us to a new stage. That's what the trumpets are all about. Whoop, whoop, whoop. This is a new stage, folks. You got to step over into it. But when you step over into it, it's not, oh, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Prophecy is not done. We have to prophesy again. Now, not only that, it says here to prophesy about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. This is not just talking about personal prophecy. This is not just talking about laying hands on somebody and saying, God loves you. And he knows what you've been going through and he wants to encourage you. I'm not making fun of that. I'm saying, but here he's talking about a different kind of prophecy. I, I believe that God, this is the prophecy that God wants to renew in the end times. That you're going to speak to nations. You're going to speak to people groups. You're going to speak to kings, governments. That's the kind of prophecies that has to be done. Many of them, many of them. Why are you in many nations? Because God wants to speak to many nations and governments and tribes and ethnic groups and kings. He said, you've got to prophesy again. There is need for more prophecy today. And there is need for prophecy to nations and to governments. I thought that was good anyway. But, but <laughs> and I want to say also something that... I'm sure that's not for anybody in this room or anybody on digitally, but I just wanted to say in any case that God has called us to influence the world around us and called us to, to, to influence governments not to complain about them. Not to complain about it. If you are complaining about your government, you just wasted the time. You wasted your breath. You wasted what could have been prophecy. Well, you wasted what could have been divine influence. I'm telling you, the, the, my, my, all my friends, the best believers I know, they, they spend, I mean, it's like a hobby. Let's complain about the government. Let's complain about the government. What are you doing? Cut it out. Cut it out. Stop it. I'll tell you why you're complaining about the government is because you don't have the faith to believe that God is sovereign over the situation. But that's ending now. We're going to take up our faith again. You read through the book of... Here's what Daniel said to, to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. He said, either... Now, of course, I'm updating it. I'm taking it a little bit out of context. But he said to Nebuchadnezzar, look, either you recognize that God is sovereign over the governments of men and he can put whoever he wants to in authority and he can remove anything out of authority or you're going to eat grass for seven years. Seven years, think about that. I feel like the Lord saying us, we, we saints, you got a choice. You got a choice. You can have unbelief and not believe that God is sovereign over the governments, and you can't influence and you can't change it, and you can't then you're gonna eat grass for the seven years of the tribulation period. You're gonna act like a, you're gonna act like an animal. Or you can believe what it says five times in the book of, of, of Daniel. That the Most High God rules in the governments of men. You don't, like, you don't like what the president's doing? Pray for him and make him change his mind. Influence for good. Influence for good. And if it's that bad, then when it comes at the next period of the election, God can remove people or put other people in. Uh-oh. You know, listen, is that what you believe about prayer for the government? Once every four years? You're going to pray once every four years for the government who to get elected? Come on. It doesn't matter who the government, it doesn't matter who the, the, the president or prime minister is. Daniel was the, was the prime for Nebuchadnezzar. The guy was a, was a maniac. You can influence him. Influence him. Push him in the right direction for making forgive for righteousness, for justice, for wisdom, for doing what's right. Don't complain about the government. Influence the government. That means we need to learn to pray for them. 
We know it doesn't matter who's in there. God is sovereign over that person. And if we pray, God can, it, the Bible says that God's heart is like a water course in the hand of God. He can just move it. You know, like the, what, the, what the king did, pray a little bit. Just, just, God will just shh, change it a little bit. Pray for those in authority. Prophesy over them. God's called us to influence history, nations, governments, peoples of this world. I don't want you going through the end times passive and eating grass and, and, and li living like an animal. But you need to believe that God is sovereign. I need to believe. We all need to believe that God is sovereign over it and our prayers and our prophecies and our righteous deeds can influence in the name of Jesus, the name of Yeshua, can influence our governments for good. Yeah. That's what you need to be doing. I don't think I still didn't get the point across here. The point is that when you're going, with the, the, it, why are we blowing this trumpet? Because I want from this time forward in every nation that you go to, you're going to go out and influence that nation for good. And you're going to influence the government for good. And you're going to change wrong decisions and you can change the election and you can move lowly people up and haughty people down and you can move the kingdom, the king in the right direction. But remember this. Don't pray right or left. Don't pray politically. Pray for righteousness. Pray for justice. Pray for the kingdom of God. Wow, I'm glad you got that. I was wondering about that one. All right, we got to finish up. Now, uh, we'll, maybe we'll get this a little more tonight, but the, the world, the Bible says that the world is moving toward two huge evil world cultures. One is called the, the great whore and the other is called the great beast. Now look guys, I don't know what you've been thinking but there's a whole bunch of weird things about this. I just wanna say, as I understand it at least, don't get offended, the word great whore is a worldwide culture that's based on sexual immorality. Is that pretty obvious? Turn on the TV, look at it. Go to the, don't go to the movies, I mean whatever it is, Everything, every kind of social media, every kind of entertainment, every kind of, it's all based in the Western world, it's all based on sexual immorality. Maybe I'm overgeneralizing a little bit, but not that much. It's all based on, on sexual immorality. And that's what the great whore, do you know what the, the word, what does it say in your Bible? Great whore? Is that, what do you have, you have another word? You know what that word is in the Greek, in the original? Great is mega, or megas. And the word for whore is porne. It's talking about a, 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 a mega pornographic spirit coming out in the end times. It's going to dominate half of world culture. Well, let me say that again, because you might not have been thinking about this way. It's not talking about the Catholic Church, folks. It's, it's talking about... 50% of human culture is going to be dominated by a demonic spirit which is called megaporne. Megasporne, which is megaporn. And it's already happening. 50% of human culture is going to be dominated by pornographic media presentations of sexual immorality. And I said, you better wake up to that. Because it influences us. It influences us as believers. It robs us of our fire and of our, of our authority and of our holiness. The other 50% is a beast empire. And the beast, the, a beast is, represents violence. And it's talking about governments that have violence and control and violence. So that the world is basically turning into what modern sociologists call today open societies and closed societies. The open societies tend to the, to the, to, toward the, the great whore and closed society tend toward the great beast. And that's what's out there, folks. And the believers in the world are in those two communities. There's believers in closed societies, in communist societies, in, in Islamic societies, in dictatorships. And there's believers in open society. And they have, we have to deal with these two things, that the, the spirit of violence on the one hand and the spirit of sexual immorality on the other hand. And we need to be equipped. We need to walk through this and, and not let it affect us. Hallelujah. That's a different message. Let's go on now. Two more verses I want to share you. Um, Revelation chapter 7, chapter 10, verse 7. He says, In the day of the sounding of the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished. The mystery of God is finished, is revealed in the seventh trumpet. 
Let me unpack that a little bit. When God gives prophecy in every generation, the prophecy is developing. You get stages of it. Each time you know more and more and more and more. But when the time you get to the seventh year of the tribulation, you, in the last feast of trumpets, that, that's it. You get the last mystery being unveiled. Oh, thank God we can read it. That's the next verse. We'll read in just a moment what it is. You don't have to wait. But that's the last, the last mystery of God because God's revelations come in stages develop one upon the other and you've got to stay in the stage that you're in right now learn from the one before and be ready for the next stage be ready for the current revelation and don't forget the past revelation because it comes in stages and it's a mystery until it gets revealed to you and then it's a revelation and this will be the last revelation about the kingdom of god is in the seventh year of the of the of the tribulation at the sounding of the seventh uh, angel Thank God we can find out what it is in another three minutes. Now, it, at the, the last stage of revelation, I just want to say, what does that mean, revelation? Everything thought starts with a thought of God. God has thoughts. Everything he built, because he has thoughts, he has things that he wants, things that he thinks. When he wants to do something with a thought, are you with me? He puts it in a word form so we can, it can, it can go out. Either spoken word or written word. A, a word is a thought put into a form that can be transferred. Let me say that again. A word is a thought that's being put into a form that it can be transferred. So when God wants to move something, he takes his thoughts on the inside and puts it in a word and either has it in scriptures or prophesied or speaks it out himself. Now, when God has a thought, he knows everything. When God has a thought that he knows and you don't know, it's a mystery to you. God has lots of thoughts that we don't know. Those are the mysteries of God. But when God tells you what a, one of his thoughts, when you get one of his thoughts, that's a revelation. It was a mystery one moment ago. When you got it, it's a revelation. A God thought that you know is a... Wait, a God thought that you don't know is a mystery. A God thought when you understand it is a revelation to you. Poor God, he has no mysteries or no revelations because he knows everything. <laughs> but when we, do, when we don't know, it's a mystery to us. When we get it, it's a revelation. And when you get a hold of it and you speak it out, then it becomes prophecy. All we're doing is speaking, it could be in prayer, it could be in preaching, it could be in prophetic words, it could be in writing a book. But when you, when you say the same thing that God said to you, you are prophesying. You are saying what he said, you are homo logeo, you are speaking the same thing that he says, and it goes out. And then you're putting into, into action. He brings his word into your heart, you're a fleshly creature. He puts it in your heart and the spirit and then you speak it out into this physical world and it comes to pass. That's how prophecy works. When you get a revelation and you begin to understand it and put it into, into practice in your life, then it's wisdom. When you first get it, it's like, wow, that's a revelation. But when you start to understand it and walk in it, then it becomes wisdom to you. It's all different parts of God's thoughts. A little comment to you here. If this is not... If you don't understand this, don't we just, I just want to make a comment here. This is the seventh shofar, the seventh trumpet. It's not the last trumpet. This is the last stage of revelation, but it's not the last act. The last act is Jesus coming back. And there's another trumpet, which is called the last trumpet. It's not on the Feast of Trumpets. It's on the Day of Atonement. That's why Jesus comes back on the Day of Atonement, which is the last trumpet which you find written in Leviticus 25, Matthew 24, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, that's the last trumpet. That's not what these are. The seventh trumpet is not the last trumpet. It's the seventh trumpet because it's on the day, it's on the Feast of Trumpets. There's another one, the last trumpet, which is on the Day of Atonement. We'll get that to another point. But on the Day of Atonement is the last trumpet, and that's when Yeshua returns to earth is on the Day of Atonement. All right, one last verse. Revelation 11:15. We just read that when the seventh angel sounded, that will be the last part of the, the last mystery of God will be revealed. And all we have to do is read the book and we can get it ahead of time. Revelation 11:15 says, the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. The last part of the revelation of God's plan, the last stage, 
is that the governments of this world transition and to be taken over by the kingdom of the Lord Yeshua. You see another reason why there's no reason to be complaining about your government? Your government's in a transition process of being taken over by the Lord Yeshua. Now, so we already talked about that, God's sovereignty. You've got to get that now. I, 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 I want you to go out and be agents of light into the end times. But one of the, you've got to get this, that God is sovereign over the government, so you won't be able to pray with authority. We can change, we can move, we can influence, always for light and for righteousness and for, and for goodness, because we believe that God is over the governments of this world. Now, it's amazing here, so I'm interpreting it. You don't have to interpret this way, because the ancient language used the word kingdom. But So what I'm understanding it is that the kingdoms of this world, I would call that the governments. The political governments of the nations of this world, and they just have the word to, to be, will become. He says, will become the kingdom of Yeshua, and then it will become eternal. What do we learn from that? Of course, the governments of this world are temporary. Yeshua's kingdom is eternal. That's another reason we don't have to worry. The second thing is that the governments of this world are transitioning to become the kingdoms, the kingdom of, of Yeshua. I, I was expecting here the word destroyed, conquered, replaced. It doesn't say that. It just says, just will be, become. Because Yeshua says that we're in those governments. We are in the nations of the world. We are in the people groups. And we are like leaven in the midst of our governments and in the midst of our nations. And it's in a process. You see, we see all the bad stuff in the news, but that's the, the shells that are about to, be, that are about to be cut, broken open. And we're about to emerge as a chick inside the, inside the shell. It's, there's an emerging process. What am I trying to say? If you don't see that there's a continuance, a transition from the governments of this world into the kingdom of Yeshua, then you just write everything off. There's no application. There's no touch point. But I'm saying in the kingdoms of this, the governments of this world, they're mostly bad right now. But there is good in them, and the good is the part that comes from God. And that's the part we are to serve and to build and to work up. And eventually that good part becomes strong enough so that when Yeshua comes back, the kingdoms of this world are destroyed, the outward part, and the kingdom of God emerges out of the governments of this world, which become the kingdom of our Lord at the moment he sets his foot down on the Mount of Olives. Now, what you see when you, because when you see it's a continuing transition, it gives you a contact point. It gives you something to pray about. It gives you an involvement. It gives you an activity. I'm trying to get you to put your hands on this situation and pray about it. It's not disconnected. What's happening right now all around you is in a process of becoming the kingdoms of our Lord. And the last thing I wanted to say was this is, thank God, God wins. And God, we, he is victorious. And if we stay on his side, we'll be victorious also. So one of the things I want to pray for today is when you shout, in just another two minutes, when you shout, I want you to believe as you shout, there's going to be that Jericho spirit of victory coming back inside of you. I want you to believe. Most of the people I know around, and I know people from all over the world, believers who've been, they've had, we've had a tough few years. And people have felt kicked around a little bit. But I want us to get that victory back. Because one thing is we are eternity minded. Every suffering, Paul said this, every suffering of this world is just temporary. It may be bad, but it's temporary. It may be bad, but it's temporary. And when the last bell rings, we're still standing, folks. It doesn't matter how much you got beat up, you know. We're still standing. We have eternity. And therefore, we can be hope minded. We can be hope focused. I'm not saying you don't see the bad things around, but we bring hope into a hopeless world. We bring eternity into a world that's falling apart. We bring victory into a world that everything is lost. I see this, maybe a last example. I don't know if you've been watching some of the news that's going on in Israel today. The Israel community is going crazy. 
I mean, we're halfway on the verge of a civil war, the left wing against the right wing, against the Palestinians, against the religious, against the secular, and we believers sometimes feel that, and they're all against us, but no, it, uh, but it doesn't make any difference. Because we, we need to be focused on the Lord's kingdom and have a victory in our hearts. Hallelujah. Well, listen, why don't you stand up? For those of you who have a shofar, you can take it, get ready. So here's what I'd like to do. Let's see if we can handle this. Here's my plan. See if it'll work. And I don't know, if, if, the worship, if anybody here still from the worship team, I'd love you to come back up because I think we could play a song at the end of this. Um, what I'd like us to do is, I'm going to ask Ben to pray and then I'll pray for you. At the end of my prayer, I want to ask us to have a minute of silence. Boy, I have great faith, huh? <laughs> I have great faith. Listen, they walked around the city of Jericho for seven days and didn't say anything. And they were Israelites who like to talk all the time. But, so I'm believing we can have one minute of silence. I'm going to pray. And then I want to say, let's shout. And when I say let's shout, if you've got a shofar, blow the shofar. If you've got a shout, shout victory. Shout hallelujah. Shout in tongues. Do anything you want. But I want to have a moment of victory for us. I want us to have a breakthrough. And I want all the things that we've talked about today is to see you be energized and go forth as God's agents, agents of light in these end times. And I can see it. Jane, I can see it all over the world in all the different places where there are glow. Of course, other ministries, other congregations, but people going out in every nation, they've got to understand the power and the meaning of prophecy so they can stand in the right place. Do you got that? Hallelujah. If I said anything that was bothersome today, please forgive me, I didn't mean it, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm passionate about getting you engaged and activated for what God wants you to do. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Let's get this time. Ben's gonna pray, then I'm gonna pray. Then in my prayer, I'm gonna ask us to take a moment of silence, and then I'm gonna say, let's shout, and then let's hit it. When we finish shouting, then, Chrissy, you can just lead us in worship. Got it? Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we are hearing today a call, a sound of the trumpet, to be able to awaken our hearts, to practically step into something at a new level. Lord, we don't want to just focus on the theology of it or trying to fit all the pegs into the holes, but Lord, we want your spirit to open our ears so that they, we, we receive the fullness of what this call is for our lives practically today. Lord, we rebuke the work of the enemy that would cause confusion and offense and would split us from this calling to stand in unity for your purposes to influence peoples and tribes and nations and tongues. Father, you love the world. Even Peter, your apostle, said that you are not slow in keeping your promises. Some understand slowness, but that you desire all to come to repentance. So, Father, we might be a light to call people back to repent, that that would be also part of our proclamation and our call, our trumpet blast. Lord, help us, strengthen us, gird us up, in your spirit. Help us be founded and grounded in your word so that we might be the people of God for this time and this yes. season in Yeshua's name. Yes. Yes. Father, I want to pray for everyone here, either here physically or digitally in the future. I pray for you and for me. I pray for us to receive an activating anointing. I pray for us to be mobilized. We hear the sound of the trumpet from heaven. We realize God is warning us of impending judgment and attack. And at the same time, you're mobilizing us to action. Lord, I pray for everyone here, you to be mobilized, you to be activated, you to be energized by the power of the Holy Spirit. You to receive a commission in the name of Yeshua to go out and represent the kingdom of God in every single nation around the world. I pray for you a prophetic anointing in power. You must prophesy again. It's not over. You must prophesy again to many nations. 
and kingdoms and tribes. And Lord, we pray that it's going to go out from here, a light, a new wave of prophecy and truth and proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom into every nation. Father, we see the darkness coming. We see the conflict coming. And Lord, we receive your mandate to us to be agents of light and truth and hope into this lost world in the name of Yeshua. And Father, I pray for us all just to receive that now. And let's all just take a moment of silence. Just a moment, we're going to shout. I hear the Lord saying one more thing. When you shout, the walls of defeat are going to come crumbling down. Yes. We're going to shout. I don't mean just for us. I mean for the whole body. There's been a spirit of despair and defeat and hopelessness. People have lost it. I want us to shout. Shout victory. And believe that all those walls, the principalities, the fortresses, the thought fortresses that of defeatism are going to come tumbling down. We're going to shout the victory and play the trumpets. And, and you ready? We're going to do it on the count of three. Ready? Get your trumpets up. Get ready to shout. Ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah!
Here we go, singing out, the enemy has been defeated, and death couldn't hold you down. The enemy 